So Suresh, given the different uh, biology of the different mutations, um, should all patients uh, be started on imatinib if they develop metastatic disease? And how, how does uh, mutation status influence our treatment decisions? I think this is why the guidelines clearly recommend that mutational analysis is highly recommended at the time of the first diagnosis. Uh, I think it's important to at least find out the subsets that we should not be starting imatinib. I think the vast majority of them are sensitive to imatinib. Imatinib is the default first line therapy in the metastatic disease setting. Uh, but the few exceptions where that would not be the right choice would be the PDGFR A D842V mutant location that you already briefly alluded to. There is a phenotype that goes with it. It's a very large gastric tumor, frequently looks indolent, but if it's a 30 centimeter tumor, people tend to get nervous about it. And the tendency tends to be, this has to be high risk and I'm gonna give this patient imatinib uh, in the adjuvant setting or even when they're eventual there is metastatic disease, but that's one subset that is resistant to imatinib. The other subset that we have to pay attention to is the so-called wild type or the non-KIT, non-PDGFR mutant subset, especially the SDH mutant subset that you talked about, where I think there is limited evidence that imatinib would be of any significant benefit. So there are some of these subsets where we have to be careful. Uh, and this is where I think having mutational analysis at the first point of entry can certainly guide therapy with regards to the best kinase inhibitor for that patient. Great. Now, Shreyash, that does uh, remind me that I, I mentioned that there are four major uh, classes of, of mutations in GIST. There are a couple of other mutations that I neglected to discuss, and so let me mention those and get your thoughts about whether these should be treated with imatinib. The other two that, that I would highlight are mutations in BRAF, and notably the V600E mutation that's also seen in commonly melanoma, uh, and uh, mutations in NF1, uh, frequently in patients who have uh, underlying neurofibromatosis type 1. Um, so those are both rare um, tumors uh, associated with the small bowel usually, um, but should these be uh, treated with imatinib? So the right answer, I guess, is that there's very, very, very limited data on there, right? So I wish that there was good evidence to support the answer one way or another. Uh, there are anecdotes of responses to BRAF inhibitors in the BRAF mutant gist. So there we have an out, if you will, that if there was that knowledge, one could certainly consider trying a BRAF inhibitor. But as all of us who treated this disease know that at some point in time, tumor develops resistance, you're kind of running out of options, in which case a trial of the standard kinase inhibitors becomes the default choice not because it's the right one, but because that's the only viable choice. For the NF1 subset, again, I think the biology tends to be variable. That's the subset that we would use routinely not treat, but I think you would need to make sure that this decision is individualized. Uh, I think these are patients who may have a variable rate of progression. Uh, and in a given patient where the rate of progression is relatively rapid, and again, these are qualitative terms and we all realize that, uh, but if the tumor's progressing at every three month interval, it's kind of hard to justify continued close observation, right? So in that setting, I think by default, we just run through the commercially available and approved agents to treat these tumors. Is there any role for conventional chemotherapy in the treatment of genesis? This has been tried. I mean, I think way back in the early to mid nineties, we presented posters and published that the standard chemotherapy just does not have activity in this disease. In fact, uh, we would always joke in the, in, in, in the conference rooms where we are designing clinical trials for a new drug, that if you want to make a new drug succeed in soft tissue sarcomas, exclude GI leiomyosarcomas. And if you want to break that drug, you include those, those, those tumors, right? So historically, even when we used to call these GI leiomyosarcomas, none of the standard chemotherapeutic agents that we think have some level of activity in soft tissue sarcomas work for this disease. So I think that's one blanket statement or emphatic statement that can be made that standard chemotherapy as defined as standard sarcoma chemotherapy has no role in the treatment of gastrointestinal stromal tumors. Great. 